Okay, Mythology in Modern Times by Josh Coker, the cleverest title in the world. <laughs> so the reason that I am making this presentation is because, as many of us know, mythology dates back to the earliest times of human history. They're some of the most ancient stories that we have. And if we look at mythology, it its sole purpose, or its, I take that back, not its sole purpose, but its major purpose is to inform society, both individuals and society as a whole, how to live during that time, during that generation, and particularly in the sense of survival. So if we look at ancient myths, you have myths about fire, myths about hunter myths, about how to gather food and, and keep the tribe alive, and then agricultural myths. And, and it, as time progresses, the myths evolve. And the question comes about, are myths still playing a role in today's society? Can we still find mythological symbols or themes in our everyday lives? And if so, are they still serving that main purpose of informing society on how to live and coexist with one another? And ultimately, my argument is going to be yes. So let's get into that. Myth is everywhere. For example, we can see myth and city names, phrases that we say, and even company symbols. Now I'm going to give you just a few examples here. City names. Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta comes from Atlantis, where we have many ancient mythologies that date back from ancient Egypt. We also have Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix being the bird in many myths that would die and then be reborn normally in fire and then athens coming from the ancient greeks phrases that we have in modern society are things like someone's achilles heel or for example with the achilles heel that's someone's weakness okay i would say that um in the gym cardio is my achilles heel the midas touch that normally denotes someone who can turn anything into money. And that comes from the ancient story of King Midas, who anything he touched turned to gold. As a matter of fact, the current president, President Trump, wrote a book whose title was called The Midas Touch. Uh, sometimes we might hear someone call uh, a man an Adonis. He's an Adonis. That normally means that's someone of great, uh, a male of, of that's very handsome. And this, again, goes back to the Adonis figure of the ancient Greeks, th those myths. Or this is utter chaos. Yet another Greek um, reference there dating back to one of the most ancient gods in the Greek pantheon. Okay. Company symbols. We have things like Starbucks. As you guys can see right here, Starbucks, the symbol that we see almost every single time that we go to get a coffee is actually a siren. These things right here, they're fins. This is a siren. And if you guys recall from the story of Odysseus, one of the challenges he faced on, on his road of trials was he had to get past the sirens in order to return home to Ithaca. But, oh, and there are other examples. I didn't pull all of these because this isn't the main part of, this isn't the main focus of the presentation, but Gatorade has a lightning bolt, which if you guys recall, the lightning bolt is the ancient symbol of Zeus. Nike's check. Nike is... A, a Greek character in the mythologies. And then also mobile gas 
has the Pegasus as a symbol, yet another mythological symbol. But so far what we've discussed, these are symbols and phrases, but are they really having an effect on informing society? And I would say the answer there is yes and no. It could be argued both ways. However, the focus of the, the rest of this presentation is actually going to be on entertainment because I believe this is what's truly informing society on the proper ways to live and coexist for good or for bad. This is where most eyeballs are and this is where most pe people spend their money and pay attention. And so the question is, can we find mythic motifs and residual effects in these in these different areas? And we're going to look at books, TV, film, and video games. So let's look at books first. According to some, some statistics that I looked up earlier today, nearly 28, it was like 27 point something billion dollars was spent on books in 2015. Now, I don't have the specific statistics metrics to to put on the screen here, but I know I've heard news in the last say six months that Amazon, in terms of just digital books, the the uh, the the purchases of those items nearly doubles every six months to a year. So this number, 28 billion, might actually be low compared to what it is now in 2017 at the time of this recording. So let's take a look. Is myth in some of these books? Well, here we have Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief by Rick, Rick Rorden. He's got a whole series. And in, in this particular series, it mainly focuses on the Greek mythological figures such as Zeus and Poseidon. In this rendition, Percy, which is short for Perseus, which is a, a, a callback to the, the Greek hero Perseus, he is Poseidon's son. But in proper Greek mythology, he's actually Zeus's son. However, this series, it's a, it's a big mix-up. The point is, this is one of the best-selling series that's been going on for over a decade now, roughly. And many of the, gen the, the generation that's growing up now, this is what they're reading. This is the big seller. And as you can see, he's got a lightning bolt in his hand. And throughout the various stories, he faces sirens and minotaurs and all kinds of his centaurs and stuff like that. So myth is definitely, we see several mythologic references in this book. Additionally, Rick Rorden, I believe he's just actually started a new series that deals with the Norse gods. But let's move on here. Harry Potter. Now, some of you guys might be asking, how does Harry Potter, I, I don't think there's any, I don't see anything about Zeus or anything like that. While that might be true, Harry Potter has several archetypes that we see in mythology, several motifs that we see in mythology, and also it follows the hero's journey. Almost all of the books follow that hero's journey concept that Joseph Campbell made famous back in the 1950s, around about that time. And as you can see right here, here's, here's the unicorn. In this particular book, there's a unicorn that ends up being slayed. Uh, Harry is uh, your stereotypical everyman hero, and he he meets several wizards along his journey who end up becoming his mentors. Two in particular, Hagrid and Dumbledore. Dumbledore serves as the goddess figure in the overarching story plot, but in this particular book, he serves as a mentor as well. And uh, and those and that's just two archetypes that we see right away. Um, and then Neil Gaiman just came out with his best-selling book about Norse mythology. Talks about all of the different Norse gods like Odin and Thor and Loki. And speaking of which, if we go to comic books, in Marvel, 
Thor and, and, and all the Norse gods, they live in Asgard just like back in the ancient Norse myths. So, again, if we're asking, are we seeing mythological references in today's society, specifically in mediums that are informing society on how to live, I would say yes. And then again, if we look at DC, in the Wonder Woman comics and in the films, right, DC, they took the, a different spin, and Wonder Woman is actually, her, her name is Diana, which is the Roman equivalent of the goddess Artemis, who is the huntress goddess. And in her story, she is raised by Amazons, which, again, another Greek mythological component and she was created she's the daughter of zeus and the brother of Ares. again two greek gods so here we're seeing in books and comic books multiple references to mythological characters and motifs now let's take a look at tv according to some statistics i looked the average household watches an average of seven hours of TV per day. Now, at first I was thinking like, wow, that seems like a lot, but you gotta remember, this isn't like one person per day. This is the average household. So that's probably split up between about three or four people. This is per day, and that's also on average. So throughout the week, maybe people aren't watching as much as seven hours, but then on the weekend, what we tend to find specifically now that we have mediums like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon where people can kind of binge watch several TV shows and episodes in a series, seven hours per day actually seems very realistic. So every day out of a 24-hour day, on average, a household is, is looking at TVs for seven hours per day. And what are they seeing? Well, back in the 90s, they were seeing this, Hercules, okay? This followed the story of Hercules, who, as everybody knows, is the ancient demigod from Greek mythology who performed many feats of heroism. If we look at a female warrior, we have Xena, the warrior princess. Another, it's almost, a, she's very similar to Wonder Woman in, in this Amazonian type of, archetype that we see here and then in the early 2000s we got an updated version of heroes which was called heroes and if we go back just very quickly to xena and hercules and some of these other figures here thor wonder woman right they all have superpowers they're all stronger than your average man faster they perform these heroic feats in this show each of these characters has superhero powers, very akin to the powers that the demigods and the heroes of ancient Greece had. And they go throughout the world, either saving people or in Skylar's, uh, Skylar's case, you know, uh, he's the villain. But this is all of the motifs that we see in this very modern show can all be taken back from the earliest of myths. Now, let's take a look at film. What about film? Film is the big monster here. According to the statistics I read, 38, it did 38 billion in sales for 2016. And it was projected, I don't have this on this particular slide, it was projected that by 2020, it would film would be pulling in about $50 billion a year. So I would say of all the mediums that we're talking about today in the entertainment sphere, film is really the big monster right now. It's, it's sort of reached its maturity in a sense. This is the major medium that people experience uh, a lot of, a lot of the, the big epic you know, stories of our time. And what are they seeing? Well, if we look at Disney movies, which Disney every year puts out a movie, 
nine times out of ten, they're either based off of a fable or a mythological story from from ancient times. For example, right here I have Sword and Stone, which is based on the Arthurian legends. And here we can see young King Arthur pulling the sword Excalibur out of the stone because he is the chosen one. Another motif that is seen throughout several mythologies. And in this particular story, he is guided by a wizard named Merlin, who serves as his mentor. Now, for those of you who are unaware, the mentor figure actually comes from the story of Odysseus. Uh, it comes from, while Odysseus was trying to return to Ithaca, his son Telemachus went on his own journey. And during that journey, Telemachus, an older man who was part of Odysseus's faction, helped Telemachus along his journey, and that's where the word mentor comes from. However, as, as that archetype developed and evolved over time, Merlin actually is, the, is sort of the, the epitome of that archetype. He's the archetype of that archetype, in a sense. And we see that in movies like Lord of the Rings, where we have Gandalf, who's essentially very similar to a Merlin figure. He's a magical wizard who guides both Frodo and the rest of the, the fellowship on this journey, this hero's journey to return the ring to Mount Doom. And while we're, while we're at it, let's talk about some of these other characters here. So Frodo serves as the everyman hero, whereas Aragorn serves more as a a uh, kingly hero, such as Giglamesh, or actually the hero that I thought he was very akin to was both Odysseus and Jason of the Argonauts, because both of those stories really go back to the 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 theme of kingliness and in a righteous king that deserves the rule of the land and and that serves the people rather than takes from the people. And, and it, as you guys might recall in the story of Odysseus, he has to, once he returns to Ithaca, he has to face the suitors in order to take back his kingdom. In a very similar sense, Aragorn has to, he has to, you know, destroy the armies of Mordor. He has, he, there's so many different things he's done. Rebuild the sword of a seal door. Uh, I think it was called Narseal, the fire of the West. He he gets the oath of the the king of the dead, the oath breakers. He's able to get them to fight it. There's so many things that are that, and they all go back to this this theme about kingliness, which we can see go all the way back to stories like of Giglamesh, which is one of the first stories that mankind ever wrote way back in ancient Sumeria. So tons of things we have over here. Lady Galadriel serves as the goddess archetype in the Lord of the Rings. And the goddess archetype, again, is this female deity who provides shelter and information and, and sometimes powerful weapons to the, the hero and his fellowship so they can continue on the journey. There's so many mythological elements here. I can't go over them all. And then if we look at a more modern story, not that Lord of the Rings wasn't, but I'm talking about like futuristic, we could look at Star Wars. Star Wars, we, we don't see the stereotypical long bearded wizard guy with a hat, but we have Obi-Wan Kenobi who was a, was a Jedi Knight. And helps Luke Skywalker, who is a young boy who hasn't quite set out into the world yet, go on his adventure. He teaches him about the Force. He gives him a, a, a light sword, a lightning sword that's called a lightsaber, right? And he meets Princess Leia, who serves as the goddess figure in this particular story. He has to face his shadow, Darth Vader. And 
a lot of things go on in the story because he's following the hero's journey. As a matter of fact, George Lucas, who is the creator of Star Wars, in several interviews has said that he specifically made Star Wars not only based on mythological themes, uh, and he did it purposely, but he actually he actually formulated it based off of the writings of Joseph Campbell, who, again, was a comparative mythologist who looked at all the ancient myths. And instead of saying what's different about them, he said, hey, what, what are all the similarities? And he came up with this thing called the hero's journey, also known as the monomyth. So that's film. That's probably the, the medium that we all, in the modern time, whether you're a kid, a teenager, an adult, or an older person, this is the medium where we see the majority of people going to. But now let's talk about a medium that's an up-and-comer, video games. According to my research, video games made $18.4 billion in 2016. And a, according to those statistics, it said that nearly 64% of all Americans had some video game playing device. This could be a tablet, this could be a phone, this could be a PlayStation or a console game or a PC. I don't have this on the slide here, but it said something to the effect of like 45 or 48 percent of Americans had a dedicated console in their houses. So that means half of, of the United States, roughly, roughly half, are using video games in order to experience stories in order to be informed about the world in order to learn and we could go on and on about all the things that video games do but what are they seeing when they're playing these video games well here we go here's one dante's inferno based off of the story okay this this one came out a few years ago it made big waves but nothing has made bigger waves than the god of war series Right here in this picture, what you're seeing is Kratos, who is the god of war. He, after slaying Ares, who is the traditional god of war in Greek mythology, Kratos is, in this installment, he's actually going to be going up against the Norse gods. But in the previous three or four installments, Kratos actually went up against Zeus. He went up against minotaurs and skylas and monsters and titans and you know all kinds of things and this this isn't just some one-off game that a couple people played this was a series that was a best-selling series over the last decade so again if we're talking about what are modern audiences doing and what are they involved in and and what is informing those those people who are playing which by the way the statistics say you, you know i assumed that the normal person playing is like a kid from say 13 to 16 year old years old come to find out and i didn't make a slide for this but the statistics say that the average person who has who plays the most on video games for guys it's a 35 year old guy and for girls it's a 44 year old woman that blew my mind <laughs> but these are the people playing these games now here again we have skyrim skyrim is based off of ancient norse mythology we see a giant dragon here that's not only a, a major motif in several different mythologies but it's also a major archetype that we see in in the stages of of mythology many times the hero must go into a dark dungeon like place or an underworld like place and they have to face this demon demonic creature that sometimes comes in the form of a demon like a balrog from lord of the rings sometimes it comes in the form of a minotaur like we've seen in, in several mythologies, and other times it comes in the form of a dragon, like this dragon we see here in, 
in if we take a look at the the other Lord of the Rings series, The Hobbit, which was also written by J.R.R. Tolkien, that too has a very famous dragon called Smaug, who represents you know greed and and all of these other things that uh, that are negative traits of humankind. So, myth is everywhere. We see it in city names. We see it in phrases that we say. We see it in company symbols that we that we go to on a daily basis. We see it in the books we read. We see it in TV. We see it in film. And we also play it when we're playing video games. My predictions, if I haven't really mentioned it already, I, th I really think that video games is the up-and-comer. That medium hasn't matured yet, but as it matures we're going to see not only video games rise, but mythology motifs and archetypes really dig in there, uh, just as we have with film and, and other... All Look, they always have mythological elements, and moreover, many times they follow the hero's journey. Or the monomyth and then um, I have virtual reality here because I believe that as we go into the next 50 to 100 years virtual reality is going to become the next big thing and then also neurotechnology and as these technologies develop and become incorporated into our daily lives just like computers and and phones have I believe that we're going to see mythological elements start to seep in and take over there as well. So in conclusion, myth is still a major influence in today's society and it will continue to perpetuate in the future. It informs our society on the proper ways to, to live and survive and to coexist with one another, just as myth did hundreds and thousands of years ago so this has been mythology in modern times